episode number 51. Welcome to the Web Marketing That Works podcast. Come behind the scenes of real life marketing experiments and listen in as amazing guests confess the truth about what really works. Now, here are your hosts, Adam Franklin and Toby Jenkins. Hi there. My name is Toby Jenkins and this is the Web Marketing That Works podcast. Thanks so much for joining me today. Now, this is the show for people who love marketing on the web and today I'm talking with the most successful cricket coach in history, John Buchanan. Now, if you don't know John, here's a quick bit of background. In actual fact, just before I get started, I was really interested to hear about John's background because he shares with me in our discussion today his unorthodox path to becoming head coach of one of Australia's most prestigious and scrutinised sporting teams, which is the Australian cricket team. And if you know anything about cricket, then you'll know that his record is super impressive. He had 75% winning record, including a number of world records for consecutive victories. Also, at the time of his retirement, the Australian cricket team were the champions across World Cup, Test and One Day forms of the game. And as I said, if you do know cricket, that's an incredible accomplishment. If you don't know cricket, then please take my word for it. John has also written three books. One was If Better Is Possible. The second was Learning From Legends, Australian Cricket. And the third was The Future of Cricket. And he now consults the business world on how to build winning teams. As you can imagine, he is a man who is never satisfied. And I loved his favorite saying in in our discussion, which is, if it ain't broke, break it. So John knows what it's like to perform under pressure. And so in today's show, we dig into the good, the bad, and the ugly from John's years of experience and the specific lessons and how they relate to you and your business and your marketing. So please enjoy. In fact, John's lessons are probably relatable to how we live our lives as well. So I hope you really take a lot from today's show. This show is brought to you by our book, Web Marketing That Works, and specifically the bonus templates that go with it. So we have 33 free templates that you can download from Blue Wire Media dot com dot au slash book so help yourself there let's get started hey okay so john thank you so much for joining us today it's really exciting to have you on the show thanks Tom. yes look uh, quite a pleasure to be here and uh, involved with blue wire media yeah well look i mean i'm certainly excited to hear and you've had a really interesting journey in your lead up to the coaching and now into business and the world of business coaching as well. So perhaps if we could start with where you're at right now, would you mind just sort of sharing a bit about what your business is now and what your team looks like and how that operates? Certainly. Look, um, I suppose when I look at uh, my business, I think it's easily described as a a business for leaders who are really trying to make a, a difference, make an impact in their business. So whether or not they... Uh, want to be a market leader, you know, be seen to be one of the innovators in their marketplace, uh, whether it's about profit, whether it's about market share, it really is firstly about the business and uh, making a difference uh, within their business. I think the second part about it, though, it, it is all about the people who make the difference. So it's the people that reside within the team and, and obviously then the, the leader who uh, or the manager who sets the agenda, who helps drive, who helps create an environment of of growth and chasing down whatever the vision for that team or organisation might be. So uh, I guess principally that's where I've come from in sport. It was about creating high-performance teams and it was about trying to coach or lead or manage those and and be able to sustain that over a period of time. So I always felt that uh, sport provides just a huge amount of valuable insights and lessons uh, for business, and that's all, basically once I finished with the Australian Cricket Team in May 2007, really that's what I wanted to do, and um, as, as I guess we were having some previous conversations off there, you know, that all progressed pretty well, and um, different things took me to different events in my life, and uh, really it's only since probably about June or July last year that I've really got stuck back into the main purpose of my business. Yeah. And so typically, are you sort of working with the entire team or are you working with individual, you know, like the CEO, for instance? Yeah. Look, um, in, in essence, it's, it's both. But I guess my starting point would always be hopefully 
around the leaders of the organisation, only because no matter how we wish to look at business and the way things operate these days, how much we want to talk about empowerment of our staff and our athletes, wherever it might be, uh, how we're democratic, we want to run a, a show. Ultimately, the leaders and the coaches, the managers, as I said before, have really got to set the agenda. So, albeit even if it is going to be totally democratic, if you like, if it's going to be driven from the bottom up and the top sort of listening rather than necessarily directing. Most people who reside in organisations, most people where they've learned and been taught and their experiences would suggest otherwise. So ultimately it's still got to be that leader who understands what it is that they want to do, where they want to take their business and then how they're going to do that. So that's really the starting point. Then, of course, there's a whole range of layers of management, even down to, in my view, the say the receptionist who sits right at the front desk, and I, I don't really mean down to, but again, as I said, people are probably used to a hierarchical sort of structure, but, uh, you know, I view the, the receptionist or it might be the waiter that you meet or waitress that you meet when you first walk into a restaurant. I see them as a key leader within the business, and uh, so it's really important that they understand where that business is going as well. Yeah. Interesting. So, John, one of the things I was really interested, if we can sort of explore your journey a bit and we'll jump into your business and marketing some more, absolutely. But I was really interested to see that in your personal journey, you know, you had a bit of an unorthodox pathway, I guess, to becoming one of the most successful cricket coaches of all time. And so I was hoping you might sort of share some of the journey. I think you started out as a teacher, right? Uh, or oh, uh, somewhere along that, yeah, not quite, but somewhere along the way there, it was it was certainly teaching. But I suppose, yeah. uh, well, perhaps even if you wouldn't mind taking yeah. it from the beginning, then. All right, right, all right. Well, spending too much time, but I, I suppose, like everybody, um, in terms of me being a cricket coach or a sports coach, I mean, my desire, my dream was always to represent my country, you know, as a player. So I, I chased that dream for a while till um, ambition and ability sort of went in different directions. So it was. <laughs> Then it was time to... And, and to, what level yeah, did you end up playing? Cricket-wise, I played a season of first-class cricket for Queensland. So right. um, that, that was as far as I got. Yep. And so then, uh, yeah, it was time to, as they would say, as a cliche goes, um, go and get a real job, you know. So it was time to uh, use my current qualifications, which I had a degree in human movement studies at that stage. So I then became a recreation officer for Townsville City Council. Uh, so that was just sort of helping with planning all of the leisure and recreation facilities in that city, which was uh, in the early 80s, and uh, married, came back to Brisbane, became part of uh, the 12th Commonwealth Games event, which was here in Brisbane in 1982. So right. I was a sport administrator within that organisation, and of course that finished. So it was then on to becoming national director for Australian Volleyball to continue on this, this sort of next dream, which was about being you know, a leading sports administrator, and I thought that might have been the pathway to follow. But I just soon found that I didn't really enjoy the administration side. I'd rather be closer to the actual uh, people, the, the um, I guess the athletes. If I couldn't be an athlete, I need to be as close to them as possible. So mm. I uh, sort of looked around and tried to work out, well, what does that mean? And I enjoyed sports. So I then went into TAFE and... Uh, got a diploma of teaching and in TAFE for, for two years. But again, just felt for some reason that wasn't exactly where I was supposed to be. So I uprooted my, my wife and our two very, very young children at that stage and we headed to Canada where I studied a master's degree in sports administration, uh, sports coaching, and, um, and eventually came back and lectured in sports admin, sports coaching, sports marketing at the University of Canberra. So... Right. Um, so that was all pretty interesting. I mean, I, yeah. I um, again, it was linking sport, it was linking this notion of educating young people to the things that I really quite enjoyed doing. But I suppose it was always a calling to try to get back to Brisbane in some way, shape or form. So eventually we returned to Brisbane in the early 90s with five young children, or no, four young children at that time. Wow. And, um, Nearly your own I, cricket team. Nearly the own cricket team, <laughs> yes, definitely. And uh, and so right at that, I came back because there was a real opportunity, again, to be involved in sport within the Department of Tourism, Sport and Racing as it was then. 
and to deliver a sport program called Aussie Sport, which is around modified sport. Uh, in other words, young children who enter sport often are faced with rules, regulations, equipment, people around them that don't realise that they're actually children. In other words, they impose an adult sort of approach to uh, young children being involved in sport. So here was Aussie Sport, which was modifying all of those sorts of things so it would make the experience far more enjoyable, far more realistic for them and far more practical and, and successful for them. So, and was that really, across multiple sports? or That was across any, yeah. We, we had about, oh, I think, 30-odd sports um, involved in that program. So it was the early forerunners uh, of uh, whatever is out there now, from quick cricket to smart rugby to uh, whatever codes now operate with this modified introduction to their particular sport. So it was a fantastic program, jointly run by the Sports Commission, um, State uh, Departments of Education and, and Sport. So uh, I continued on that until um, there was an advert for Coach of Queensland uh, Cricket, the Bulls team, and uh, I thought, well, here's an opportunity to go back into cricket, but could I coach? And I suppose... When I look back on my career now, that was really a watershed moment for me because it actually made me stop and really look back over my life, right back to my early school days and and around parents and teachers and coaches and peers and all my good and bad experiences in in sport and cricket, plus then my, I guess, my academic background, plus my work experiences and so on. really began to work out that a lot of the things that, that I had been doing was all around coaching, but hadn't quite put that together till now I was thinking I was going to apply for this head coach of the Queensland Bulls job. So, as I said, yeah, watershed moment for me, because it made me sit down and work out my whole coaching philosophy, what I, why I did what I did. And so that's what I then took to Queensland Cricket. Um, they gave me the opportunity to coach Queensland, did that for five years, and uh, towards the end of that, I was then, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to coach Australia, so I did that for the next eight years. So that took me through to that World Cup in uh, the West Indies 2007 and, and then uh, back now into this um, consulting game. Mm. So that's a, a brief synopsis of, of why I got to where I got to, I suppose. Yeah, that's interesting. And so in terms of that sort of deconstruction, I guess, of your life up until the point at which you decide to become a coach – and the creation of your coaching philosophy. I mean, was that a sort of a sat down overnight and bashed it out or was it a, oh, a week long uh, process or a month long <laughs> process or? Yeah, you know, look, um, sort of work? I mean, so I'm sure some people can do that. I guess when I go into business, businesses these days or even when I talk to sport coaches you know, a lot of times, that's the first question I ask. I mean, if I was to ask somebody to tell me in 30 seconds or less what their coaching philosophy is, could they do it? And I would say certainly in business the answer would be no from about 90 to 95% and probably in sport coaching the answer is somewhere between 70 and 80% uh, you know, in rough figures. It doesn't mean that they don't have one, it just means they haven't really thought about what it is that they do. Um, well, it revolves around firstly having a, a vision, I guess, my view always is whatever I'm involved in or with a group of people, um, I want to take them somewhere where they haven't been before. Uh, I want to do something that hasn't been done before. I want to change the game. I don't want to play the same game as everybody else uh, because obviously that always can give you some real competitive advantage uh, no matter what the marketplace you operate in. But I often find, again, that when you look at business uh, vision statements or missions or, or so on, it's almost a cut and paste job. You could actually take their vision statements and place it in any, any other business, either within their marketplace or elsewhere, and it, it really wouldn't make too much difference, you know. So, I, I think people miss the point about what a vision is. So, when I go back to my early childhood, when I had this dream of playing for Australia, and that's what I'm talking about. It is about dreams, and uh, so when I was with the Australian cricket team, you know, that was really the analogy. It was all always about Everest. We we're always uh, trying to climb Everest, and we'd reset that, you know, whatever the project might be, whatever the length of time might be, but but the concept was Everest. We were going to be doing something that nobody else had done or very few people had done. And, of course, the um, imagery of, of Everest is, is it's 
about the highest mountain that we know of. It's a dangerous climb. Not many people can do it. It takes a lot of planning, a lot of preparation. And of course, there's no guarantees that you're ever going to make it, you know. So, but to me, that's what a vision is. It's something that is really incredibly inspiring. And even if you don't get there, it takes you well in front of most of the opposition in wherever your game is being played. So, yeah, so vision is one part. Then the next is around leadership culture and leadership culture, um, et cetera, is, is really about how the leader operates and for me it's about trying to make myself redundant um, so my job like parenting is is gradually to, to step further and further away to allow you know the staff or the athletes to be the decision makers to, to notion of empowering them but at the same stage as a leader you, you still need to have some control so you become sort of like a puppeteer in many respects but really trying to give them the opportunity to make decisions and in doing that they become their own best coach and that's why you can become less important to them or less controlling of them or less directive so they become their own best coach and really make good decisions on your behalf it is about trying to know your your staff or your athletes as a person not just as an athlete or a staff person it's really trying to establish that that really a firm solid relationship with all the people and, and of course that very much depends upon how much the individual wants to let you into their lives and then you know Coming out of the teaching background, I guess, what I've seen good and not so good, it is around the planning, the organisation, you know, the preparation really needs to go into making something successful, whether you're, you know, cooking a meal or cooking up, a, you know, an assault on a, on a World Cup. Good preparation gives you some chance of getting there, making a good meal or, or, or making a, a reasonable fist of a, of a World Cup. So, Yep. So, you know, they're kind of some of the things. One of the other bits and pieces of philosophy sits around never being satisfied. So it is just a case of if it ain't broke, break it. I really believe that no matter what we do, no matter how well we do, it can always be done better. So it's always constantly looking for that edge, looking for something new, something that will enable us to still be right at the forefront, be that game changer. So that's not 30 seconds or less, obviously, no. but if no, I just have to list down, Thank you. <laughs> list down the points... That's all I, I mean to say to people. You know, you should be able to just quickly highlight the points and then people know what you are. Because in the, I mentioned relationships in there, and to me that's the fundamental part of leadership or the coaching or the managing, and, and that is relationships. You know, so unless the leader or the coach understands their philosophy very clearly, then they run the risk of not delivering that consistently. And if they don't deliver that consistently, then they really run the risk of fracturing a relationship between they and the staff or wherever it might be. And once fractured, very difficult to get it back. So very important to understand why you do what you do. Yeah. Wow. Oh, well, thanks so much for sharing that, John. That's amazing. Fascinating as well. I mean, I've played a lot of water polo and so it's really interesting to hear a coaching philosophy. I guess I've spent a lot more time in an athlete's shoes. So it's great to hear that. Thank you. Oh, that's all right. But as a water polo player, you had your head under the water most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> make much I was difference. spending most of my time trying to keep it above the water, actually, but it wasn't always successful either. Well, maybe you had earplugs in and those big muffs on your head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. So that's the philosophy, and I presume that's the sort of philosophy that you're teaching others as a business coach. Is that right? It's my philosophy, and yes. it doesn't necessarily mean it should be anybody else's philosophy. But the fundamental point is that they need to actually understand their own philosophy. So going back to one of your other questions before, how long did it take to bash it out? As I said, when I look back from applying for the job to when I went to the interview, I might have had four or five weeks to make a final interview. And so for me, my process was to go to a quiet place and ask myself those sorts of questions. You know, why do I do what I do? And my quiet place in those days was running, so I used to just sort of head out and and run and think through things and it would crystallise some ideas and thoughts in my my mind. So it probably took me about three weeks to come together with the philosophy, which really haven't changed at all. They're they're my reference points, so whether things are going well or not, you know, I'll always come back to those base reference points to see whether or not I'm actually living my philosophy. Yeah, oh, that's brilliant. And is it something that you've written down? Yes, 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 it's all down there oh great that's really interesting thanks for sharing that so your current business is you know your coaching business do you have a team or is it just you or yeah look it's uh myself my my wife but you know i guess um the future may present itself that there might be 
various sorts of things that would require me to expand that a little bit into either services or products that, that may come from this Buchanan Success Coaching. But really what I believe is in terms of the philosophy and, and the experiences and the lessons and being able to walk through those, that's me and there's no other way of delivering that. And I think that's really important for those who want to access that sort of knowledge or informational service. Yep. But um, importantly, I think what I have done when we look at maybe the, the marketing of the, the business uh, it is now around about networks and alliances. So, uh, you know, I've struck up a, a number of alliances which uh, are both um, complementary uh, by way of what they do and what they offer, but also the way that they think. So that to me is one way of if you like expanding the business, the second way will obviously be through better marketing online of what I do, how I go about it, and how people can reach me. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, would you mind sharing a couple of examples of who those alliances are? Yes. I have um, a group in, in Melbourne. They're a company called Beyond 19, and they're very much into, I guess, organisational cadence. In other words, you being water, a water polo guy, understand that really if you're going to get a ball into the, the net at the far end and uh, you're going to consistently do that and jump out of the pool at the end of the game with more goals on your scoreboard than there is on the on the other side, you've actually all got to work together over a period of time. You've got to understand a bit of a game strategy and uh, you've got to then try and execute that through the course of a game. So all relatively simple, but Beyond 19 sort of have a different way of going about pulling all those pieces together so an organisation and leaders really can understand that. So my role there is obviously around, again, the leadership around the coaching to assist Beyond 19 and those organisations that they work with to do that. I'm also, um, uh, there's a, a company in Brisbane called Divest IT and um, Part of being a high-performance team, I think, is really understanding how to measure performance. And again, of course, all businesses uh, do do that in, in some way, shape or form. And they also do that through their people in terms of performance management or, and generally use you know, some sort of profiling, performance appraisals, 360s, you name it. Mm. But again, um, you can sure reflect on being an athlete and I believe athletes are one of the most performance managed measured workers in, on the planet I mean there are other people like sales people I guess and there are others uh, that might have to produce end of week or uh, end of fortnight end of month results you know uh, week in week out month in month out but nonetheless they, they still don't necessarily uh, get measured across other indicators of performance so uh, you know, as an athlete, you know at the start of a week, you're preparing for a, a match, and we can relate that to being a project in business. Uh, so right at the start of the week, you know, that you've got the coaches who are looking at all your technical skills, are they good enough, you know, and then they'll have a game plan. So how does that fit into the game plan? Where can you impact the game? What position should play, et cetera? So you need to look at your technical skills. Obviously, then you'll have trainers who are looking at your physical skills. Can you... While you might have the technique, can you deliver those through the course of the game and at the highest moments of the game, which may be towards the end of the game, will he be fatigued, etc.? So can he actually deliver that? You've got your physios who look at, you know, how you're, you're managing any sort of niggles that you might have. You know, that progresses right through the week and people are keeping an eye on you until you actually get to game time, play the game, and of course you've still got lots of stats on your game performance, which are measured by coaches and support staff, but equally right at that time you're measured by stakeholders. So that can be fans, friends, family, media, etc. Certainly your opposition. Yeah. And and that's seen on a scoreboard. Middle in, in Portfolio, there's only, you know, a brief scoreboard which shows a score, but in lots of other cases, you know, individuals' performances, e.g. cricket, are, are seen well and truly by way of snapshot, at least on a scoreboard. So when I go into business, and it's been, and I haven't been part of it myself in terms of uh, managing and leading people and, and trying to assess performance uh, over a period of time when all you do is measure it or at least sit people down every six months, but probably only every 12 months. You know, this, this notion of 
performance appraisal is to me ludicrous and, uh, and, and very inaccurate because what we're trying to do, what athletes get from being measured is good, accurate, precise feedback. That to me seems to be exceptionally important in any, in any sphere. But, you know, in business, I mean, really, if you're trying to chase down a particular vision, you want to know that you're not only going in the right direction, but all your people and all your little teams within the broader team are actually moving in that direction too. So I think this divested IT and myself and one or two other people, we're, we're looking at, uh, into this whole performance management area, but making it very applicable, very usable and uh, very accurate so that at any one given moment in time, could be a day, could be a week, at the end of a week, could be the end of a fortnight, which would be the longest period of time. Uh, individuals' performances can be seen. Uh, they can be rolled up into the, the groups or the teams that they work within and they can be rolled up further. So I think that will be a tremendous advantage to an organisation who really is uh, trying to achieve something special with where they are and where they want to be. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, that aligns quite well with, I guess, that whole sort of lean or agile approach to project management where you're trying to break it down into smaller and smaller chunks and learning faster because you're closing the loop more quickly. Um, And interestingly, you know, from a marketing standpoint as well, I think, you know, one of the benefits of doing marketing online particularly is that you have the opportunity to learn with every blog post or with every email newsletter that you send or what have you, the opportunities to learn. You you do, and I think... um... It can't be just around um, the numbers game. Uh, the numbers are really important. So, again, in sport, as you know, I mean, you, you've you got to get results. And as a coach or a leader manager, if they get results, these days it doesn't seem like you hang around too long. Results is always important, but we've got to try to understand the process of getting those results. We've got to try to understand what are the key numbers in behind that. And numbers that not only drive results, but numbers or at least indicators that will drive culture or, or team cohesiveness or the health and well-being of an individual. So they all become, I think, really critical in terms of, of shaping what it is that we're going to measure, both for the individual and the teams. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that'll be an exciting project. And I mean, I know Nige Hine, obviously, from um, mm. Divest IT as well. So might have to catch up with him about that as well. I think you should. Yeah, sounds like it. So, John, if we could sort of dig a bit more into your the sort of marketing that you've done for your business now with networks and alliances being your primary sort of driver. I also know, I mean, you're really active online as well. You've got your newsletter, um, you're doing videos and you've got your YouTube channel and that sort of thing as well. Um, Mm. Would you mind sharing a few stories that perhaps initially what's worked well for you, do you feel? Yeah, look, um, as you say, I I suppose when I came back uh, from overseas and began to uh, look at my website and also what it is that I was trying to achieve, I guess I tried to sort through some people who might give me some reliable information. And so one of those alliances is with a company called Data Solutions and uh, I've done some, been doing some work with them because we were looking at producing some online modules which we've done two of. Uh, so when I came back um, it was really a case of saying well that's all very well but how do people find me? You know like one, I guess one of the advantages that I still have that I do have a, a brand which albeit that it's not as, as current as maybe as it was in 2007. There's still a brand there as opposed to people just beginning out in a, in a business. So the, the brand helps. So how do I build on that? How do I attract people to a website? How do I tell them what I do? So we, we began to look at the website and found that it was probably not quite as functional as it should have been. So then looked at an SEO consultant who has given us some insights into how that should improve, and I guess you know that's a never-ending uh, story. That one, if, once you start <laughs> heading down that route, so you know we're kind of at a stage where I think we've learned a little bit and probably sufficient. Well, enough at the moment; otherwise, we'll never get any work done. So you know, it's just just a case of being satisfied for the time being that you might have got a couple of things uh, certainly improved. Um, Do you see any one thing that was glaring that a um, listener could learn from? Well, yeah, I mean, basically it was just, I guess, the essential thing was around content and content marketing. So, 
you know, while I had some information there, it, it wasn't appealing to a search engine, if you like. It wasn't appealing to getting people to come to that site. So now it's really about content generation and making it far more easy for people to access the content. Yep. The second part of that then is, is about really trying to have a call to action uh, with the content. So if we can attract people to that website and they get interested in something, then it takes them to somewhere, whether that's, you know, subscribe to the newsletter, whether that's looking at the online modules, you know, whether that's going to the YouTube channel and so on, mm. or the YouTube working the other way, you know, and therefore what I'm saying is trying to link all those things together to enable people to begin to find me and then begin to want to ask questions about, well, maybe there is some value there from this person, but at least I might follow them for a period of time. And of course, LinkedIn then has, has become one of the more important vehicles for me. I, I understand that Facebook and Twitter and so on are, are I think, part of, in inverted commas, the new age leader, manager and so on. And while I'm not ignoring them, I'm not spending much time with them at the moment. I'm trying to do one thing at a time. So Yeah. I know. actually think that's a great lesson for people, John, is that it is really important to pick your battles because there are so many options. That's a great philosophy to pick yeah. your battles and go with something that either fits your personality well or fits your business particularly well as well as opposed to trying to do everything at once. Yes. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and I mean, it would be nice, again, yeah, to be across everything, but there is just so much out there, as I said before. The, the SEO stuff is just mind-blowing in terms of Google Analytics and everything else that you can really uh, just spend a huge amount of time in. But obviously, it could be beneficial, but I still have to get out there and, and uh, run the business as well. And, and, and I think that's still the best form of marketing. I mean, it, it is referrals. It is about doing a quality job. That's what I value most highly, that if I do have a, a business relationship that I provide, I believe, exceptional value for money. And I'm hoping that sort of approach uh, will still drive the business mainly, but it needs to be aided by other marketing tools or devices these days to make sure that while I'm in what I'm doing, the word can still be spreading it at other times and in other places in Australia and around the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love that approach, really. And it's good to hear that you're on the content bandwagon there, John. That's great to hear. And in terms of the mechanics of what you do, do you write blog posts? Do you create videos? What's your sort of preference? I actually enjoy writing the, the blogs. It just takes me too bloody long. But I do enjoy putting it together. But uh, the YouTube is good, if I think, if, you know, you can get the right topic and then you can produce uh, a short three to five minute YouTube on that subject and maybe with some additional information. I, I guess, you know, when you look, I look at myself and there's so much that comes across my computer these days, you know, I know that if I feel it's going to take me a period of time to get through it, then it's kind of consigned to later and later generally means probably never, <laughs> um, you know, so. I just feel whatever I produce, hopefully the reader, the listener, the watcher, in a short period of time, be able to get a message. I mean, if you go to my book, if better is possible. Uh, I guess that's how I wrote it in the first place. And I still am very much the same. I, I sort of enjoy reading books, but it seems to me that I, I start a book and that I never finish it because, you know, it, it generally means I've got to read one chapter and then go to the next chapter and the next chapter, and the next chapter, and then of course, when I don't get to it for a while, then I seem to—I feel like I've got to go back and reread something to sort of get back into the swing of the, the book. So, you know, it seemed to me busy people just don't have time to do that. So I wrote a book on the basis that um, the chapters were only you know four or five pages long with big print, you know, and lots of gaps, so that the, you know there's not a lot of a lot of reading time have to be spent. There's a message at the end of it which kind of summarises the chapter, so some takeaways from the chapter, but then every chapter is independent of each other, so they could read chapter 38 as opposed to chapter 14 and just, you know, get the messages that they want. And so that's what it seems to me that, uh, you know, we really need to be able to uh, get a good message across relatively quickly. And then, of course, if people want to, and have time to get more while they have the opportunity of doing it. Yeah, 
It's interesting, isn't it? I certainly feel as though books have almost trended towards that, you know, in that each chapter has a heading and almost, you know, it is a standalone piece of work as opposed to necessarily the entirety of the book required. So it's interesting to hear that you set out to do that on purpose. Mm, Yeah, yeah. Have you had any sort of surprising results or things that have surprised you in terms of the marketing of your business that you've done? Um, well, probably only what I kind of said before, the uh, complexity of, of that SEO. I mean, I just didn't realise what that was all about. And it was good to learn, I suppose, because then that makes me very clear on why I use the site and how I use the site to try to gain some sort of place in the market. So that's probably was the most surprising thing, you know, exactly how that operates and then trying to put all the time and resources, you know, that I do put into that, that will make that easier for people to access what it is that I'm doing. You know, that's relatively recent. That's probably only in the last four or five months. So now I'm, as I said, trying to track that a little bit through use of Google Analytics or, you know, the, the newsletter data that comes back and then trying to make some decisions based on that sort of feedback to enhance what it is that we're doing. Yeah, great. So, John, I've got the other piece that really sort of stuck out for me in terms of my reading of your background and stuff and your philosophies too was the idea that, you know, you really focused process as a part of your coaching Mm. philosophy. Could you sort of explain a bit more of that and yeah, if you could explain mm. that piece of the philosophy and also then how you put that into practice, I'd be really interested. Yeah, sure. Well, look, I suppose, again, just to go back to that Queensland coaching job. So the interview was obviously about head coach of Queensland at that stage, which is 1994-95. And uh, Queensland hadn't won a Sheffield Shield in 69 years of trying. And as I mentioned, I had won unsuccessful season with Queensland uh, trying to do exactly the same thing. So when I sat in the interview and they asked, or the interview panel asked me, well, how are you going to win the Shield? To me, that was the wrong question. And, and that's what I said. I said, that's, I don't see that as the job. So going back to my own philosophy and then also going back to the way that I think uh, you know, businesses can operate, it, it's about really having a clear picture on what it is that you want to be, where you want to go. So I said to them, really, why I'm here is to enable Queensland to dominate domestic cricket for the next 10 years. So that's where we're going. What we need to do is work out how to do that, which is the process. We need to look at the systems and the the processes within Queensland cricket so that we can chase that vision. And then in doing so, somewhere along the line, will get the result that you're after, which is winning a shield. So how did, how did they respond to that, if you don't? Well, they must have because I got the job. Yeah, <laughs> obviously. Uh, yeah, and I, and I guess um, that's always been the way that I've tried to do what I do, that I really try to, even though I just talked a little bit before about scoreboards, uh, and as I said, I, you, you, no matter where you go in life, there's no way of avoiding a scoreboard in inverted commas. You know, we all need to get some form of result, whatever that might be, wherever we operate. Uh, so results are always still important. But to me, if results consume everybody's thinking, then even if you get the result, I wonder if you know actually how you got the result. I wonder if you really know then how you can sustain the result. So that's why I always came back to the, the process. So. The process then was just that, you know, like we would break the game or our our operation down into technical, physical, mental, tactical and team. And so in underneath those headings, you know, applying the things that I said before, you know, if we wanted to dominate uh, domestic cricket, well, do we have the right skill sets or what are the right skill sets? And then given those are the skills that we think we require, what have we got currently? And then, therefore, that begins to outline a a training program. It begins to outline a recruitment program. It begins to outline, you know, a bit of talent identification and so on. So really beginning to try to ensure that everybody understands, yes, there's results, but how do we get them? So 
you know, at the end of a game, um, there would be feedback to to players, and the, and the players would obviously know their score or their, their wickets taken or their fielding results because that's what they're concerned about. Yeah. But with that would lie some of the process results because you know we were the first to introduce computers in '94 or '95 into the game to really begin to analyse the game over and above the intuition, the knowledge and experience of all our athletes. And, of course, that's really valuable stuff to have. But as I said before, I really wanted to make analysis and then feedback far more precise uh, so that I think it could be far more impactful. So, therefore, at the end of the game, rather than sort of saying, oh, so-and-so had a good game, so-and-so didn't have a good game, and generally that was based on some highlights or lowlights and a bit like when you go to performance appraisals, you know, you sit down and you do their performance appraisal, but because it's been over a six-month period or a 12-month period, really that's what you remember, some highlights, some lowlights, and possibly just the last week or two uh, because that's the most recent. Uh, so therefore, really what I wanted to do was to make sure that we could provide far more precise information that would give us uh, as a group and then individuals um, far better means of preparing themselves for you know, the next project or the next game. And so really that just all around the process and the systems to support that, you know, the system, IT system, in broad terms, the communication system. So how do we communicate that? You know, and that can be just your informal coaching. It can be your formal coaching. It can be the reports that you put forward. It can be how you use a whiteboard, how you use meetings, etc. So it's all those things and getting those right. And then, as I said before, never being satisfied because, you know, once you've got them to a point, then really you need to actually improve them because they become, you know, they just become tired or they become, everybody becomes used to them. And there's no secret of the fact that, you know, athletes and, and a lot of staff people, I mean, we have meetings uh, for a day. And so how do you run your meetings so that they're not meetings? How do you... Uh, have them in such a shape that actually people want to be there or they can stay awake, you know. So <laughs> it's constantly try, just trying to work out all those things that, that work for you, you know, and then obviously team culture and becomes one of the key processes that uh, makes for, you know, strong and successful teams. Uh, you know, a great book at the moment, uh, or it's been out for a little while now, um, it's called uh, Legacy and it's... Um, 15 Lessons in Management or Leadership, Leadership might be, of, of the All Blacks, written by a bloke by the name James Kerr. And it's a really good insight into how the All Blacks do what they do. But it, a lot of it's just based around simple common sense, but it actually works. You know, they actually, you know, the biggest thing about it, any sort of culture is whatever it is, and we all have cultures, that it is actually evidence there is actions and behaviors and and the good actions and the good behaviors are rewarded and their poor actions and the poor behaviors are dealt with there are consequences for those you know and if you can have that sort of system not only administered by the leader but administered by the group then it becomes a pretty powerful uh, instrument and uh, of course that's you know what we're always trying to do but the all blacks have managed to do that relatively successfully over a long period of time they sure have but nearly any benchmark you choose to, I guess, for it. Yes, exactly. Extraordinary exactly. team. Yeah, well, that's a really interesting point, actually, John, because the sort of last question I wanted to ask you was who do you learn from in person or books or blogs or presentations, you know, friendships, mentorships? Yeah, all of the above. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that's important. You know, I think one of the things that certainly sports don't do well is to go outside of themselves and learn from other sports but business outside of sport in terms of um, all the sort of things that we've just been talking about. While it's invaluable to retain knowledge and experience of your business or of your sport and to have access to that, I think it's always really important to actually have that challenged as well. And the only way to challenge that is to go outside and it's sort of the balcony view or the helicopter view, isn't it? It's the ability to, to look back in objectively and not be tied in with either uh, historical uh, or emotional baggage of, of your own business. Uh, so for me, therefore, it was always important to, and still is, to sort of read widely, albeit that I said I only get about two chapters into a book. Um, <laughs> Hopefully the know, best two chapters. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the net's obviously a really good place to just 
Do you follow anyone that. in particular or any particular no, authors that you really enjoy? No, I don't really. Um, you know, what I do like on the net is, you know, I'm in various LinkedIn groups and there's always some really interesting discussions in there and then somebody will mention a particular system or a book or something and say you can dive off and have a look at that. It is about your networks and, um, you know, tapping into those people. And obviously it, it's always not, not what's in it for me. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, lots of people will want to tap into me as well and I'm happy to provide that information because I, or whatever they're seeking because I just think that's how individuals and teams can improve. You know, they one, they don't have to agree with anything I say, but at least they've asked a few questions um, or, uh, you know, they might get an idea and, and adapt it for their own business. So, you know, going back to when we talked about my, about my philosophy, I mean, in the end, you know, I can talk a heck of a lot to people about it, but it's about what you do yourself and how you put things in place yourself. And it's very difficult to transpose or impose somebody else's way of being and way of doing into yourself and then regurgitate that in, in your setting. So it's just, I think, always important to keep your ears and your eyes open, scan the horizons, and, and really, if there's something that, that interests you, then explore it for as long as you need to or as long as you can and see where it takes you and see how it may become part of what you do or not do because that's just as important a decision as, as it is if you want to adapt it. That's a really interesting point in terms of choosing what not to do because as a coach and now in business as well, you must, you know, information overload is a pretty common problem, right? Um, yeah. How did you go about, what did you find were your criteria or was it just coming back to that, you know, your philosophy, did it align with your philosophy or not? Do you have criteria that you use consistently or have used in the past? No, look, I think it really has to align or be aligned with your own philosophy. So if you, if you know that, then there is information or there are situations or there are people who you really prick your ears up for or uh, are interested in reading more on. And conversely, there are others that have little or no interest. And so I think it... You know, it, it is that ability to filter what's useful, maybe what's important and what's not important. And as I said, what you can leave for later, which probably becomes never. Yeah. <laughs> yep, indeed. Oh, well, John, look, thank you so much for joining me today. And it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. Final question is just how can people connect with you and find out more about you? Yeah, thanks, Toby. Look, uh, the easiest place always is the website, so the usual www.buchanancoaching.com. Um, I'll, make sure that's, I'll make sure all these links are in the show notes, John, as well. All so right, thanks, can Toby. grab them from the blog post, yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Or, you know, LinkedIn, uh, I'm on there, so connect with me on LinkedIn, John Buchanan or uh, Buchanan Success Coaching's up there as a company site. So they're probably the, the easiest ways to at least begin the connections. Great. Oh, well, look, thanks so much again, John, and it's been uh, fantastic talking to you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks very much, Toby. So that's a wrap with John Buchanan. I hope you really enjoyed the show. This is brought to you by Web Marketing That Works, the book, and specifically the bonus 33 free templates that go with it. So if you'd like to download those, head on over to bluewiremedia.com.au backslash book. The intent is to deliver actionable advice, so please, your feedback and questions are welcome. Let me know at toby.jenkins at bluewiremedia.com.au on email or at toby underscore Jenkins on Twitter. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments. If you enjoyed the show also, we'd love you to leave a review on iTunes. Thank you so much to everyone who does, and thank you so much for joining me again.